<laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, as she said, Melissa Murphy, um, I see a few familiar faces in the room. Um, for those who don't know me, I am, I've been a professor with Chapo for the last 10 years. I teach anything sort of product, brand, marketing, communications, innovation related. So that's a lot, right? Um, one of the reasons why I'm here today is I do work with the corporate startup lab. So who here knows what the corporate startup lab is? Just a hand raise. Half? Good. I like that. So Corporate Startup Lab is about bringing entrepreneurial innovation into large companies. So it's sort of this, this nexus of where the entrepreneur and those learnings and those ability to ideate and be agile and fast, how do we take those and apply those in a larger corporate setting? So really interesting program. The tool I'm going to walk you through today is actually from um, the Corporate Startup Lab capstone that we do. Um, and if you're interested in hearing more about that, you can ask me or you can ask Hallie in the back and we can tell you more about the process for that and the timing. And if you even wanna give a plug at the end of just dates, that would be awesome. Um, so what we're talking about today though is pitching innovation to the C-suite. This is a tool that we created and used for the capstone, but it, I'm taking it a little bit broader today and really just talking about pitching innovation in general. So it could be within a large company and to a board of directors or to uh, executives, but it could also be pitching innovation to a VC firm as well. These same rules apply and these same learnings that apply. So bear with me for a second. I'm actually gonna read this to sort of kick us off a little bit, but I think it's important to, it, it's important in sort of setting the stage for what I wanna cover today. So imagine you have your dream job at your dream company and you've been selected to present your team's innovation efforts to the executive team. Leading up to the presentation, you rehearse, you prepare. When the meeting starts, you feel the nerves take hold. You control your jitters just enough to make it through the first few points, but then the CFO chimes in with a question that catches you off guard. Then the CEO interjects, and before you know it, they're, they don't know what, uh, and you don't know what the answer, they think you don't know what the answer is and you haven't said a word in 15 minutes. The executives then carry on a high level conversation without your involvement and you never have a chance to get the presentation back on track. Um, maybe that's something someone in the audience has experienced. I've experienced it um, more times than I can count in my 30 years of giving presentations. Um, and so we're gonna talk a little bit about how did this happen? Why did it happen? And can we get it back on track from that? The key insight though that I want you to take from that is don't be surprised when things like that happen. So whether you're presenting to a VC firm, you're presenting to executives, you're presenting to a group of any size group of people with it, um, things can go off the rails. You can get questions that have nothing to do with what you're presenting. There can be side conversations that occur, very, very common. And so the first thing I'll tell you is be prepared for that because that's gonna happen. Um, the second part of it that's really clear and important that we'll talk about is what's the part of that presentation that's the most important? We have a tendency to spend so much time creating slides and building these beautiful slides and animation and visuals. And we're so proud of this, this deck of PowerPoint slides. Um, but what happens a lot with that is in the end, you're not spending enough time thinking about the Q&A session. So I've done a lot of investor calls in my day. And I can tell you from doing earnings, um, quarterly earnings calls to um, end of year reviews, when you're pitching, uh, I shouldn't say pitching, that's not the right word. When you're communicating to the street of how your company is performing, um, it's a speech and it's all well rehearsed and well done. And it's the questions, that's where all the good stuff happens. If you're listening to any investor calls, or if you've never listened to an investor call, I highly recommend it but stay on it for the end for the Q&A section because that's where success and failure happen 100%. And we'll talk more about that. Um, so yes, don't let a bad Q&A session or an off topic sort of derail what you're trying to accomplish and get across with that. So here are some of the common challenges that we hear when people are presenting to the C-suite in particular. Um, is being blindsided by questions from outside their area of expertise. I can tell you as someone who's pitched innovation in new products time and time and time again, if I'm a leader in a certain area, the CEO, the CFO, the, the chief legal officer will ask me questions that I am not prepared for or that I haven't thought about or that I may not be the expert on. So some people stutter when that happens. Some answer the questions, but it might not be the right answers. Some defer and say, oh, can I get back to you on that? 
either way, it disrupts the rhythm of your presentation and how you feel. And it really affects um, the people that you're presenting to because it shows a lack of sort of um, confidence and commitment in what you're presenting when you start struggling and your face gets red and your hands are nervous. Um, so it's important that we know that and prepare for that, not just the slides with the Q&A. Um, even well-prepared corporate entrepreneurs have high stakes conversations um, and, and traditional startup CEOs with stakeholders come with narrow perspectives. So sometimes when we present, it's someone jumping right at the gun. We're five minutes in and they're asking questions that affect their area, which is a very small part of your presentation. So we're gonna talk about that. That's definitely a challenge. Um, when you're pitching an idea, particularly to a cross-functional team, that's when the most, most of the challenges can happen with that. And when I say cross-functional, I mean, you've got somebody from engineering, you might have somebody from tech, legal, marketing, sales, and you've got this group in a room that all have very different agendas for why they're there. And your job as the presenter there is to know that and understand what's their agenda in the meeting. Why are they there? What's important to them? What questions are they going to have? Um, and who in that room is also going to sort of set the tone for our conversation? Are they going to come out the first five minutes with really tough questions? Are they going to give you some time? These are all important things that we should know in advance if we can do that part of it. Um, one of the real challenges from pitching innovation and new products in particular is that we hear a lot, and I've experienced this more times than I can count personally, is defending our ideas early. So what we find a lot is through innovation work, we have a lot of ideas, a lot of great thinking, a lot of energy, a lot of enthusiasm. And we might be struggling a little bit with how we prioritize them, how we look at their value in the long term. Um, but it's really challenging in the early stages of innovation work to sort of uh, be able to answer all the questions that you're going to be asked for it. So defending those ideas early is really important. And sometimes you're doing that when you don't have all the information that you need or you don't have all the learnings in yet. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, an interesting observation too, is that when we're pitching to a corporate team, um, we have less room for error. And some of my entrepreneurs aren't gonna like that comment, but it's true because when I'm pitching to VCs, I have the ability to pitch to one. And then if it goes well, fantastic. If it doesn't, I move on to the next. When you're pitching to a corporate team, that's the only corporate team that matters. <laughs> so you've got one shot to do your innovation, um, pitching and telling the story and showing the products for that. So there's a lot less tolerance for error. So you have a chance there for things to be shot down really early in the process. Um, and that's a big challenge as well with it. Um, the other last piece of it is what you see here, more breadth required. So corporate entrepreneurs will face scrutiny from many disciplines and projects. Again, this goes back to the point I was making about having this cross-functional audience and all having different agendas in the meetings for that. One of the things that I like to do, and we'll get into this in, in a second, but is really think about who's in the room and actually talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. Group meetings can be a disaster um, to have because there's a lot of things and a lot of agendas going on at the same time. So the ability to do some one-on-one -on -one interviews, talk to people candidly, talk to them before they know, and, and figure out who your worst critics are. In my case, a lot of times we saw the CFO, um, or believe it or not, legal being the ones that were the ones that were challenging. So I always made it a point to talk with them one-on-one. -on -one. And if I can't get the CEO, because odds are I probably can't get a one-on-one -on -one with the CEO because he's busy, I will meet with somebody on his team who knows him well and say, hey, help me figure out where the holes are in my presentation. Where can I add detail to that? How can I make this presentation I'm giving be successful for that? Um, the worst thing that happens is you do the presentation and you keep your head down and you don't share it with anyone in advance and you don't have any inputs from people. Um, part of doing innovation work in a corporate setting, it's really important. You're bringing a whole group of people along with you across multiple functions. So you've got to be able to do it in a way that knows what their agendas are, what their concerns are, and how you're going to deal with those. So the best thing we always want to do is anticipate what are the questions, what are the challenges, 
and having an answer prepared in advance for those. And that sounds like a lot of work to do that part of it. Um, it's critical for success, in my opinion, to do that. And the idea of pre-selling your concept, your product ahead of time is super helpful to do because that one-on-one -on -one interaction is likely to give you more room for discussion versus me standing up here in a presentation and you know going word by word with not a lot of dialogue back and forth. So some things to think about. So one of the tools that we mentioned that I mentioned earlier is the pitching innovation to the C-suite. This is a tool that was created for the corporate startup lab, and we use it as part of our capstone program. And it really gets at this exact challenge of how do I pitch innovation inside a company? This can equally be useful if you're pitching to a VC firm, but for most of my examples, I'm gonna do pitching to a company because that's what we focus on and CSL. So this is a look at the canvas. I'm sure you've seen business model canvases. You've used other tools that are similar to that, but this is all about capturing questions. So I'm gonna break these down um, a little bit for you. So from the CEO perspective, you know, how does your idea fit in the long-term direction of the company? Okay, that's a big question. How does my pre presentation address that? How do I prepare for that? Do I even know the long-term direction of the company? Um, CEO, does it affect cannibalize existing markets or open new ones? Does it make the company a better company? Does the idea make sense on a roadmap or is it a one-off? What do the huge successes and failures look like for the company and how is the world different? And if this idea achieves its maximum potential. So one of the things about CEOs that I will always tell you, and this is a hundred percent consistent is their view of the world is large. So while they may be interested in the details of your presentation, they're always going to be looking at it through a lens that says, how does this fit with everything else I'm doing? Is this the right priority? Is this the right strategy? Is this where I want to spend the money? Because one of the things that we always talk about is there's never enough time, there's never enough people, and there's never enough money to do innovation, marketing, new products work for. We always want more. What that forces us to do is set strategy and have a plan for that. So we need to know going into this, where does this fit in this much larger architecture? Is it a priority? Is it a product or a brand that, they're, that they care about? Is this taking the company in a new direction? Am I cannibalizing my current market? All those things are really important. The CEO will always be looking at it through that lens, that bigger picture of where does this piece fit into it? So don't be surprised when the questions come and they're bigger and broader than you expected to be because you're absolutely going to get those because that's what they're thinking about. And some of the things that come across with that section normally can be, it can be about the company, the company structure. It can be about the long-term vision of the company, but can also be about where the category is going. So where's the category headed? Is this an opportunity? Are we gaining market share by doing this? I need to understand all of those to be able to look at an innovation idea and see if that's a good one. So CEO is an important one. Obviously, if you're in front of the CEO, you've probably done your homework to a certain level that's gotten to that point, but you still have to be prepared for the conversation, maybe to go off from what you expected it to. And we'll talk about how do we get it back on track a little bit with that. COO, some of the questions a COO might ask is how might this idea integrate with our existing processes? Again, how does it fit in the big picture? How does it align with our culture? Is this going to take away from what my team is already doing? Do we have the right resources and enough of the right resources to do this well? Because there's nothing worse than doing innovation work and launching new products that don't have the support you need to launch them in the marketplace and reach your target audience with them. Uh, will pursuing this, implementing this idea, create any spillover effects in other operations? So again, we're looking at context. So the most relevant thing you can take from this is what's the context of what you're pitching? Where does it fit? Who are my friends? Who are my skeptics in the company? How do I handle those? How do I prepare for those? And what, what questions do I think I'm going to get from that? Uh, CTO hat, is this idea even feasible? Do we need to buy, borrow, and or invent? Um, that's a really good question because you know what, in doing a lot of strategy work, strategy work is about making a choice on how we solve a problem. There's never one way to do anything. So this is all about looking at strategy and saying, hey, here are the different ways we can solve for it. And then this is the one we recommend. So a CTO might ask that question of understanding what's the best way to solve for this problem. 
Maybe the idea is good, but there's a better external partner. Maybe it's an acquisition we want to make. Maybe it's a licensing deal. Those are a lot of ways. Your answer that you're recommending is not the only answer. So you need to think about it in terms of what other ideas, what other ways could you execute this, reach that audience, gain that margin share, um, because someone is absolutely going to raise that question. Is this the best way to do it? Uh, CMO. So who's the target? Is this overlapping with any of our existing markets? How will customers find out about it? How does the ideal fit? Um, so one of the courses that I teach um, actually for the III is called Launching New Products. So it's all about that exact question of not only did I create the product, did I do it well? How did I launch it? How did I bring it to the marketplace? What does that look like? Um, that's actually one of the really big areas of failure is the execution plan around bringing the product to market. So I guarantee you a CMO is going to be asking questions about that and thinking through that piece of it. And why that's important is if you're looking at a company that's spending a lot on innovation, they should also be spending a lot on marketing. Where I get nervous is if the innovation budget, engineering R&D budget is high and the marketing's not there to support it. That means I can create a great product, but I probably can't launch it flawlessly. So understanding how these paths work together and how we think about them is an important part of that. And that's a really, actually a side note, a really good tip when you're interviewing and you're asking about innovation and product is talking about um, the support that goes behind both of them. Um, if you're not seeing that support, that should be a little bit of a concern that, okay, we can create it, but can we launch it? And can we launch it successfully for that? Okay, the chief legal officer is never your friend. Um, their entire job is to poke holes in what you're doing. And that's important and it's fair. And we need them to do that because we don't want recalls or problems in the marketplace. Um, you're never gonna win, in my opinion, with the chief legal officer. But what I wanna do is neutralize, neutralize the person. And by neutralize, I mean, talk to them in advance. What are their biggest concerns? What are their biggest problems? Who's in our space that's already doing this? Are we too close to copying anybody? Um, you know, what are their hot buttons? The sooner I know the hot buttons, the better I can come up with an answer to a question. But if I don't know what they are and I'm caught off guard, that's when I have problems with it. So when I look at, actually, I would say finance and legal that way, is that their job is to look for holes. It's to poke and say, that doesn't add up. That's not right. Are you really gonna achieve those? Um, I have a old uh, person that I used to work with for a long time. And his what he would always say is um, cut the uh, expected revenue in half and double the marketing costs. And that's a realistic view of it. If you can't break even by doing that, he would say, don't do it because he never believed the projections we had. So take those projections, cut them in half and double your costs and see if you still make money on it. Um, we laughed, we joked about it, but people sat there and did it. And it was a good test to say, okay, what's my projection? What's it gonna look like? How off am I? Where's my, how much room of error do I have? And what happens when it's either exceeds it, do I have enough product or I don't hit the number how is that going to affect my business performance with it? All really important. Um, and back to chief legal, yeah, neutralize, neutralize, neutralize with that. And one-on-one -on -one because they're very good. They're used to having a room of people to listen to and present to. So um, definitely make them a friend, not a foe. The same for finance. I used to say in my marketing organizations to brand managers that you couldn't get promoted unless finance blessed your promotion on it. Um, that was the toughest audience. They were the toughest critics. And if they thought that you have what it takes, then good, you move forward in it. So it's important to be able to speak these different languages within the company and be able to do that. <clears throat> CFO, always another tough one. What are the next steps? What are you really buying with that investment? What are we learning? What might the cost look like? What are our biggest drivers of the cost? What's the upside? What's the re savings, revenue, improved productivity? Uh, what, how many resources do we need that are non-monetary and biggest assumptions behind the cost and upside? So I will tell you that last piece of biggest assumptions will be an incredibly important part of any presentation you do on innovation because that's where the good, the bad, and the ugly can happen because if your projections are off, the results are off and then it all sort of falls apart. 
Um, I've always been one to present multiple scenarios for this reason. Sometimes I have them in the deck. Sometimes I have them with me in my, in my back pocket in case I get questions, but wondering, okay, what if we miss it by 10%? What does that mean? What if we exceed it by 10%? What does that mean? I've been on both sides of it where we've not met goals or we've exceeded them and we didn't have the product to supply. So either way, being off of your projections is a challenge. So understanding what they are and understanding the multiple scenarios that come to play with them is an important part of understanding that, especially for the CFO. And like I said, you, you may not get access directly to a CFO or to some of these C-suite level folks. They definitely have people that work for them that know what they're looking for, what their concerns are, um, what questions they're going to ask. Use those resources. Um, it is time well spent in preparation for the meeting. Um, this is something that we use uh, as well during the CSL capstone. And what we encourage everyone to do is to fill out each of those boxes with their own questions for it. So think about what you're doing. Think about any new products that you're working on and whether you're pitching VCs or you're pitching a corporate team, what are the questions that these different groups may think? Um, I don't always go to the trouble of putting every question with an answer on a piece of paper. Um, but there are a lot of times when we've done that because the team is large and massive and there's a lot of people and we want people saying the same thing and delivering these same messages. So we have put it on paper, but at least identifying what the top questions are and preparing for those um, will save you a lot of stress and heartache in that meeting. So some tips on doing it. Um, I alluded to this earlier, but honestly, it's one of the biggest tips I would give to anyone for doing almost just about anything in the work environment, in our corporate environment, is pre-selling. COVID really did a number on the ability to pre-sell. Before COVID, we could be in the hallway together. I could see you walking to your car or maybe on your way out to lunch. Those quick five, 10 minute conversations are very, very valuable. Um, it gives you an indication where there's problems, where there might be problems, where you might get questions from it. So it's a really important part of that. Now we're in a world where we're on Zoom a lot, which is forcing us to work harder and be able to reach out to people and find that 15 minutes to ask a few questions. And we have to be a lot more deliberate about it. Um, don't forget to do that part of it. I know in our world, we're working across geographies and time zones. There is still no replacement for a one-on-one -on -one conversation if you can do it. So definitely think about that. And um like I said, the pre-selling is a really great way to do that because then at least then you should know what you're up against. Who are the critics? Who are the supporters? What are they going to ask? What are they going to do? I always want to know everyone's role and their opinions before I walk into that meeting. Um, I used to work with a client that was a trade association and they had three companies that were members and they were very, very competitive and confrontational and argumentative with each other. The only way we got work done was to pitch each company individually so that the meeting then became a formality for it. And it sounds crazy, but it's how we got it done. So we'd all like to work in the perfect world where that doesn't happen, but the reality is it can. So we met with each company one-on-one, -on -one, gave the presentation, made our sales pitch, got them to agree to it. So that when we got in the room together where there was a lot of physical and intellectual posturing going on, they were already on board. So they might put a little show on to show that they've scrutinized the idea, but they were still engaged and on board with it. So you got to look at who you're talking to and what's the best way to move it forward. How can I learn something from all of these people that I'm talking to? How can I learn it? How can I apply it? How can I prepare for it? I might probably hit all these. Yeah. Um, so preparing for the Q&A. I strongly recommend if you don't use the CSL tool, at least creating your own list of running questions. Um, I don't think you always have to put the answers down to them, but I think the idea of capturing those questions and preparing yourself for what you might get asked is incredibly valuable and helps you mentally really prepare for the presentations that you're going to be giving on it. Um, you should also know when you're walking into that room, you may have an hour for your presentation. I don't know many CEOs that are going to sit in the same room for an hour. So you always have to be prepared for it to go short, get to the point faster, move it along. 
Um, so think about timing. You have to be able to get their attention and keep it before it goes in a different direction from that. Um, we had some team meetings where there were lots of questions and I never worried. There are going to be too many questions and we we're going to go on a sidetrack for it. There's other meetings and pitches I've been in where there were no questions. That is actually more uncomfortable than having questions flying at me from a bunch of different people for it because it's like, okay, so that when that happens, that's when I call on people I know that are either on my team or one of the areas that I work with to say, hey, you know what, do me a favor, ask that question in the meeting today or ask, you know, raise that point um, and your concern with it. I'd rather get it all out there because I want the meeting to happen in the meeting room. I don't want side conversations afterwards tanking what I'm doing. So I want to know what I'm up against. I want to prepare for it. And I want to use the people that are in the room that are my allies to help make that happen for it. There's nothing wrong with doing that. It sounds very orchestrated, but a little bit of orchestration is always needed, at least in my opinion. Um, the other thing that I'll do too is say, hey, you know what, we got a good question from X person um, in our last meeting. I wanted to bring that up again and, and provide some answers to that or some way to just keep that dialogue going, keeping it current with that. It's a great time to be proactive about sharing your key messages about your product and what you're doing as well. So what I say is don't let a bad Q&A session ruin your presentation that you're giving. Um, in all the many, many, many presentations I've done, that's the section that really was the biggest challenge and was the hardest one to learn how to do successfully. Um, if you haven't been in one of those, I've had plenty where I've been the person presenting and I could feel it in my chest when the question came that I hadn't thought about it, completely throws off my rhythm, makes me feel differently about it. So, um, Anticipate, 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 and know what you're walking into and who you're walking into it with. Questions about that. I know this is, I've been pretty talk, talk, talk. I'd like to hear from some of you about the questions that you have though, or maybe specific instances where um, you've dealt with challenging audiences during a pitch or a presentation. Anybody have an experience to share? Sure, great. Uh, yeah. kind of question. So for the legal part, mm -hmm. really so like Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it's, let me think if I have a resource off the top of my head. What I would say is if you're presenting and you haven't had a chance to do that, you should know your category inside and out. Um, and your category should tell you, have there been any previous crises in your category that you should prepare for? Um, you know, has, have you gone through a recall before? Have you had to change packaging because of labeling issues or government relations pieces with it? So I would look to peers and see what they've dealt with. That's the easiest way to do it and see where they've made stakes. There's a lot of work that's done in the area of sort of crisis communications, but I think that's taking it a little further than, than what we're talking about here today. Um, but I would look at the peer set and say, what have they gone through? No problem is original. Very rarely do we say this has never happened before. People say it, but it's not true. Um, it's happened before somewhere, typically in their own category, and it just hasn't happened to them personally. So it's important to understand all of that um, as you're going about it. What else? Anyone want to share a bad presentation or a point where they got stuck? Come on, it had to happen. I know that. It's happened to all of us. Go ahead. I have a question. Sure. So doing one of my pitches, which is a product to certain set of people, and uh, they pointed out a flaw in the product, which I was aware about, and I had already worked it out. Mm -hmm. But like, you probably know that it takes time for a, a change to come into the manufacturing line and eventually come out as a mm -hmm. changed device product. So I got stuck there when they just insisted on not believing that this Correction has happened, but it's going to take a while to come mm -hmm. into the line of uh, manufactured products. So, yep. how do I negotiate that kind of thing? Yeah, so that's a great question. And it's all about knowing who our critics are and what their agenda is or what their stance is on something. Um, typically, if I have an incident like that, I don't wait for the question, I answer it before it comes up because I know they're going to talk about it and I know they're going to ask about it. 
So I'm going to, I'm going to take it head on and communicate it proactively first, and then ask if they have questions about it. Because what happens is it, they end up, you end up feeling like I found it, we're dealing with it, but they're talking to you like you didn't. So we get defensive because we feel like, you know, we're doing this work. We are, we know what we're doing and we start to get defensive. And then that takes the conversation in the wrong path. It's never about us, the person. It's always about the product and here's what our plan is. And the faster you can address it before it's asked, the better. Um, I've even started presentations with some of those concerns before and just said, hey, I want to I want to start with a clean slate today. Let's recap these few things. Here's our plan. Okay, now let's get to this. Because sometimes that elephant in the room prohibits people from listening and processing everything else that you're saying. So I know if I've got someone talking and that they're going to, they're stuck. They're just going to keep going back to that. I take it head on, go first with that and start it. Um, I also meet with them one-on-one -on -one in advance to make sure that their concerns are valid, that they see the report um, and see what's going on, but it still may not completely get them to, to buy what you're selling, but I'd still do the effort and I would address it before they ask. What else? It's more of a general question about working with C-suite. So in my experience, bigger organizations, like the larger the organization is, the more inertia you have to overcome. Like they <laughs> don't want to change anything. So like, do you have any like experiences to speak of or um, insights as to how to like convince like innovative ideas, things that might be deemed too risky to a C-suite executive? It's a great question. And so it's something we talk about in a lot of the courses is how do we deal with change? I'm sorry, people do not like change. They do not always want the new and improved version of things. They say they do, but they're not, they're skeptical. So if you've ever studied any decision science work or looked at things, you'll know change is hard. Even when it's a good change, it's a still a hard thing to do. So when I'm pitching something that affects change and I need change in behavior with that, I need to have a pretty detailed plan about how I'm gonna change that. Because when we're talking about changing behavior or changing habits, it doesn't happen in a snap. It's not easy. It's not one thing that happens. I have to really know that audience, understand them, go deep, understand their habits, and then talk about how I'm going to sway them. Because sometimes it's getting them to just try a new product. That's actually sometimes easier than getting them to change a whole habit that they have on the way they do something. So this is a little off topic, but it's really, really relevant to understand the depth of your users and their relationship with their current products. So if they're current products and it's a very deep, loyal relationship, even if your product is better, that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't mean you're going to get them to change. Think about the Apple infrastructure that they've built. Genius, absolutely genius. We don't even think about it. We just go buy the next new thing from Apple if you have those product categories. So they've been able to build it in a way not to change our behavior. We just go to the Apple store. It's easy. So we have to think about our target audience, our customers, and understand their relationships with the products in our category, our competitors, how they use them, and then understand that to think about what do we need to do to change them? Um, because change is hard and it takes a lot and it's not an easy thing to do. We did um, one of the capstone projects we were working with Optum Healthcare on, and they were coming up with different four different um, ideas, four different products with that. And one of the groups had a really great idea, had a really great problem. The challenge that they faced was that the audience that they were reaching out to didn't want to change. So whether they should change, yes. Whether they're going to change, hmm, I'm not sure. So understanding what it was going to take to change that behavior becomes really, really critical and understanding the steps that go with that. So when I'm thinking about it, more from a workplace standpoint within my company, looking at my employees and changing their behavior, I have to understand, is this going to make their job harder, faster? Where, where are all the parts of the company that it touches? Are we all on the same page for it? Um, in a large company, everything you do is cross-functional. Um, it touches someone else. It's impossible to think of it, of the silos. Um, it can play out that way. But the reality is nobody can get their job done without the other players on the team for it. So understanding who they are and how hard it is to change something um, is a is a really good thing to think about. What were you considering for that one? Well, I'm, I'm going to compare 
background and it's like completely stagnant for them. Like they, it just takes so long to uh, get the inputs and sort of change systemically. Mm -hmm. um, when, yeah, it's it's one of the toughest things because it's exactly what we were looking at. Um, we were looking at a couple of different areas, but related around mental health. But then it was also targeting men and looking at um, getting colonoscopies and some precancerous tests done. It, and it was it was hard moving the needle on something like that and changing an, a, a, a whole universe's perception takes time. It's not going to happen right away. It's not going to last. What you've got to do, think about it when you're building your product and you're building it step by step. We do some work, we learn, we test it, we learn, we build some product, we test it, we learn. It's the same way when you're trying to change perceptions is it's sort of a, you have to treat it almost like a living, breathing thing and that you're constantly ideating, is this working, isn't it working? You're testing things, you're getting feedback, you're seeing if you're moving the needle because it takes, it takes time. Changing behavior is hard. I mean, trying to get people to exercise to have healthier lifestyles, let alone all the other things in the marketplace. Very, very challenging. We also looked at it in terms of um, at-home monitoring, monitoring devices as well for that. And how could we be a passive watcher of the person so that they didn't have to report things, that they didn't have to be the one translating it and getting back to us, that we could see for ourselves what they were doing, what they weren't doing, what worked, what didn't work is also uh, an interesting challenge to have specifically with healthcare too. Yeah. So one of the things you could have done in advance is done some testing and done a smaller group with it. Um, awfully in the startup environment, we don't have the time, the money, or the patience to do that. But just like anything else, testing is important and we learn from it. So I would do that. Um, something like that, again, I'm one... I don't want to like sit with my head down and kind of wait for the shoe to drop on me. I, I want to say, hey, here's the problem. Here's what we did. We thought it was going to work. It didn't work. Here's why. Here's what we learned. And here's how we're going to do it next time. So make it a learning experience, not just, you know what, we did this and it didn't work. Okay, that, yeah, that doesn't look or feel good to anyone involved. But to say, we did it. It didn't work. Here's why. What did I learn? How am I going to do it now? And make it a learning exercise is a better way to do that. And depends on your work environment. Some work environments will still be very critical of failure and bring it up again and again and again. Others are more fluid and willing to accept there's going to be failure and there's going to be mistakes. How do we deal with them? How do we communicate it? How do we make it better? What did we learn that we can now know going forward to change what we do? Does that help? <laughs> It's a ch nobody likes to fail. Nobody likes to make mistakes. It never feels good. But you know, like it's one of those times where you have to own it, own it. And what did you learn from it? And how are you going to fix it moving forward? You got to keep it going because if you don't, nobody else will. Let's we'll just keep rehashing it over and over. And that's another thing about a publicly held company is because of quarterly earnings and um, year end earnings, there things come up again and again and again. So it, yes, this is the reason it didn't, we failed something this year. Well, next year, when we do our financials, we're going to have to talk about it again, because it will say why our number was lower last year. So this idea of fail, failure, um, you're not going to hear about it once in a large company. You're going to hear about it over and over and over again. And all you can do is not be defensive, not own it, just focus on, yeah, we did. It was a failure. Okay. What are we going to learn from that? How are we going to move forward from it? Um, and be the momentum to make that change happen or to push it forward to, to get it onto another topic. 
Does that help? Does that answer the question? What else? Question. So, and I would say this for um, the C-suite as well. It's that idea of two, two points. One is that the um, audiences, you may not have all the time that you were supposed to have. So you have to be ready to do the 15 minute version of your one hour presentation. You should always, always be ready for that or the hallway questions on it that you're gonna get when the CEO sees you in the hallway on the way to the bathroom, be ready for those. Um, but in terms of VC, what I, I think what can be particularly helpful is that you have your presentation and you wanna share about your product and your ideas. The more you can make it conversational, and the less you make it feel like a formal presentation, the better off you're going to be. The more interactive it is, the better. Um, so I think anything that you can do to make it a discussion versus a full presentation helps that. Um, it's okay to have some of it, but if you have an hour, okay, 50, you can have 15 minutes to do a formal presentation, but then I would leave room for questions, discussions, ideas. A lot of those VCs that you're meeting with are an incredible wealth of information and knowledge. So think about it when you're in there, you're not just selling your product, what can you learn from them? What have they seen in other categories? What other information can they tell you? Um, that doesn't make you look bad to ask those kind of questions. Um, you're curious, you're interested, you wanna do well, and it shows that you're taking information from everywhere. So anything that can get you to a conversational level, just like a job interview. And there's a formal part, but the conversational part is normally where things are decided. So be ready for that, facilitate it if need be, um, and, and get that feedback because it can be really helpful and valuable. I'm, I'm one to want to take on all positive and negative feedback. I'm never offended or afraid of that because I'd rather know than not know um, so that I can address it and communicate it for it. What else? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in a like traditional startup setting, like pitching to the VC, your usual like, big ask is funding, right? But in a corporate setting, you might have other asks like resources, like you're asking mm -hmm. for you know X amount of engineers to help develop this. Um, I'm curious, like aside from that difference, um, you know, also with VCs, they go through the due diligence process. How does that differ in a corporate setting? What does that look like? And like, when are decisions actually made? So on the corporate side, I'm going to start with that. Yeah, yeah there's a lot of questions all at once. Let me see if I make sure, remind me if I don't hit all of them. Um, on the corporate side of it, it's slow, even in the best companies. It is a slow process. Um, some There's so much has been done with agile and technology to make things faster. There's still human beings making decisions. I still have to get human beings on board and that takes time with it. Um, so typically I, um, you know, we have a portfolio of new products. So it was it, it, one of the dangers of people doing innovation work is they think it's all about one product and whether it's to a VC or to the corporate setting, it's never about one product. It's about the portfolio of products. Does this fit? Is this my best option? Is this the most profitable? How does it fit in with what I'm already doing? So I think understanding that context is really important. Um, a VC is not looking for that type of context, but what they're looking for is from the marketplace standpoint, where does it fit in the marketplace? Who else is working on it? Who are those indirect competitors? Who are the direct competitors? And sort of what does that landscape look like? Um, and I think internally, you have that. I think it's one of the challenges of corporate though, is you're, you're pitching against all the other ideas in the portfolio. So sometimes I'd like to know what I'm up against as well. So I want to understand, you know, what are the leading products in our portfolio that I'm pitching for resources for, whether that's people or money or time. Um, there's always context that you need to have and understand. If you can understand that I can pitch appropriately with that. But if I don't know that that position on it, it makes it harder for me to sell it the best way possible because at the end of the day, I'm selling something for sure. One of the other things on that note that I think of a lot is we would have people come in and give these really enthusiastic presentations and be really excited about the product. 
And you know what? It, it, there are many times it backfired on them. So some enthusiasm is good, but if it appears too much like you're drinking your own Kool-Aid and that you believe it too much, that you're not paying attention to some of the watchouts, that can actually work against you as well. So understanding watchouts are really important in either setting. Um, because if you have, if you come with all good news to a CEO, you just blew it. You lost all credibility. It's never all good. It's not a personal reflection of you. That's sort of, here's everything that we're doing. Here's what's working. Here's what's not working. And what do we learn from that? And again, repurpose it in, in that way, shape or form. What else did you ask? Um, just like the, I guess, post pitching, that mm -hmm. decision making process. I've, I'm just wondering, cause I, I've come from a startup environment, mm -hmm. not a corporate environment. So like, I'm assuming all these people then get together, they have their discussions. I yeah. That yeah. So for uh, typically the way we would see it broken down for innovation would be that there are closer in innovation and further out innovation. Those closer in innovations happening more routinely, that further out innovation, there was typically a cross-functional team working on that that was making those decisions at the portfolio level. And then there were people executing it for it. So yeah, it, it it's meetings, it's presentations, it's presenting it, but my goal in doing that was always to bring something new to each presentation because sometimes it's the same people, sometimes it's not, but I want the energy for the product to be there. And I want to be able to share new insights about the audience or a feature that we learned that's more important to them. Um, so think about you're, you're almost teaching a little bit as you're giving these presentations that helps. Um, as far as timing goes, it can really vary. That closer in innovation is kind of a rolling budget. Um, on the corporate side of it, um, and the longer term, even more so than that. But what I would tell anyone that's pitching a longer process or a product that has that much time to it, break it down. What do we need to do to get to this first step? How much is that going to cost? What am I going to learn? How do I get to the second step? How much is that going to cost? What am I going to learn from that? And if you think about it that way, it feels one less personal. And two, it's more fact-based. And you know what? Even if it's a failure, you can still learn a lot of really good information from it. So what is that? And how do I apply that and think about that? Did that answer all of them? Yeah. Okay. You. Sorry. You got a question as well? Yeah. Uh, so going back to the topic of chain. Um, so as you mentioned, as C-suite doesn't really like chain. Nobody does. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> especially them. Uh, and innovation is typically thought to be disruptive. Mm -hmm. Right in most cases. So, uh, if if in a way if you're limiting um, disruption, you're limiting innovation. So, how do you balance both while you're pitching to the C suite? So, like, do you not go into too much of detail, or how do you go about that? So, I think one of the things to think about if it's a publicly held company and it's large, growth is important. So, as much as they don't like change, they need growth is more important. That's what they're getting questions about. How are you going to grow? How are you going to make it bigger? How are you going to be more successful? So I think understanding that perspective um, is really important in positioning it for that. Um, I also, as far as depth of your presentation, I know I can tell you, and we can talk afterwards, but like we can come up with the top five questions the CEO and the CFO are going to ask. Easy. You should be able to do that. It's not hard. Um, can you answer those questions? What are they? If I have to give the 15 minute version of my 50 slide presentation, what does that look like? And what questions do I answer in that? I'm a big believer of um, what you have right here is a park slide, a slide that has everything on it that people can refer to. You may not read all of it, but I can always refer to it. Oh, remember what I said on the CEO hat or remember what I said on that. So having one slide that is either normally your first or your last is a good place to have something um, when the conversation goes sideways or you want to refer back to something or you have to do a quick version of it. Um, so I challenge you all to have one slide and see if you can do that. Other questions? These are great. Yeah. It's kind of going back to the question that came up like, hmm, in this context, we've been thinking about innovation when it's product innovation kind of mm -hmm. thing. Uh, but what if your innovation or your idea is something that's stunning? 
uh, or like your kitchen is changeable workshop, for example. Changeable what? Workshop. So again, challenging, change is challenging for that. Um, and you've got to think about, um, if we're looking at internal audiences in that case, would you say? So if we're looking at our internal audiences, the process isn't really that different of, do we understand our audience? Do we know who they are? Do we know how they currently work? Okay, we're, we're saying there's going to be these changes. What does that process look like? Who does it touch and affect? And is it really worthwhile to make that change? Sometimes something a little bit better isn't enough reason to make a big change inside your company. If you're looking at your structures, um, the way you do your manufacturing, the way you do operations, um, small changes sometimes aren't worth it. So it's got to be, is it worth it to it? So is it something that's going to make a difference? Can we make it better? Are we making it more competitive? Are we, you know, what's the end goal we're trying to accomplish with this change? And then when I'm dealing specifically with employees, again, not to sound like a broken record, but I break it down into phases, into timelines, what they can expect. I anticipate what their questions are going to be um, and think it through from there. Um, I I'm Internal audiences can be tough when you're trying to do something like a workflow for it. Um, that's a, a real case of, well, if we change this one thing, it may change five other things. Um, is that really worth it? Do we really, is that gonna add enough value to make that happen? So I think understanding and being honest about what you're, what you're suggesting, what you're recommending and understanding is that, you know, is, is it worth it? Challenge yourself a little bit to say, is it worth it to change all these steps? Um, what's the outcome going to be from that? Um, and evaluate it that way, just like we would an external opportunity for it. Does that help? If you can, if you give me more specifics, I can get more specific too. So. Oh, that's good. I mean, I, I, I was just thinking about if I can just hear because I've been in situations where it's like, um, I want to pitch product idea, but it is dependent on system change. Um, and then it's like the kind of resistance is definitely defensiveness on mm -hmm. the part of like whoever you're pitching to is going to say like I'm going to feel representative of the current system, right? Mm -hmm. So that's often like the threshold that you have to come over that's really difficult. <laughs> I, I would agree with that. And there are going to be times where the audience you are talking to is defensive or you know isn't fully on board with it, I go back to the first thing I said, and, and those are the people I meet with one-on-one. -on -one. Because it's gonna be a tough conversation, but better we have it one-on-one -on -one than have it in a group meeting. And understand where you are and take it into consideration. And again, even repeating it back in a large meeting, hey, when Jim and I met, we talked about this these concerns um, and, and taking them head on with it, I think is important to do that. Um, and sometimes it's people, that are the problem. Sometimes it, you know, it's the process and it's complicated. Um, but big companies roll out new things all the time. So they'll have new EDP systems or new programs, and they have people have to employees have to train and you have to teach them new things. Um, as long as you can lay that out in a good way and show what the change is going to create, then I think you're okay. I think where I see a lot of failure with the internal ones is not having enough detail in the plan. Um, of how they're going to communicate it. And again, how they're going to make change happen. Change isn't easy. We're always going to go back to what we know. So how are you going to change behavior? Or how are you going to reward behavior change? And what does that process look like? Um, it's hard. It's always harder than people think it is. So the more you can map it out to show the steps, I think at least it always made me feel more confident about what I was doing, that there was at least a good plan behind it against some of these concerns. I think there's another another hand up. Yep. Go ahead. Uh, so say for an example, we'll be uh, going into the workforce fresh out of mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, maybe with a couple of years of experience, uh, but we wouldn't be leading, say, a huge team or a division, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so if there's something that we would like to innovate or something that we would like to change, it would be first necessary to go to our managers, yep. right? So is there a difference between pitching it to them versus the C-suite? Um, normally, if I'm pitching it to the C-suite, I'm a little further along, possibly, than I might be taking it to a boss. Um, in that situation, I would want to meet with the boss. I would want to pitch it. But again, I would look at everything around us. Because, yes, it may be a good idea. 
is now the right time for it. With everything else we have going on, the priorities we have, the work we're doing is now the, the right time for that. Timing's a big part of new products and innovation. Whether we're talking about the internal aspects of that with a company or we're talking about the marketplace, timing is a very delicate balance. So understanding when's the right time to have those conversations could be good. Um, and I'd actually go back to um, knowing my boss to know, is my boss someone who likes a full set of slides in front of him? Or is my boss someone who will run out for lunch for 15 minutes and would rather walk and talk, do it? Or is it someone that's better for drinks afterwards? So understanding who you're talking to and where you can have the most constructive conversation can be really helpful. Because if it's sort of a, like a big, crazy idea, I don't want it shoved between two other meetings because my brain is just like, get me through this day, let alone solve the world's problems with it. So if it's something like that, I definitely think about the time of when and where I pitch it because they have, they have to be in the right frame of mind to be like, either after a problem or after a long day that you need some room to kind of let that ruminate a little bit and think about it and talk about it. Um, so to me, in that case, it's more of when you're saying it and how you're saying it um, can be really helpful. And I would encourage everyone with who's looking in a new job of understanding your boss and your boss's boss of how they operate. Are they in every day at six and they like things early and very punctual? Do they actually work late a lot? Guess what? When those of us that work late, we're normally a lot more casual after 6 p.m. than we are before 6 p.m. So we might be more willing to listen then. Um, or you know what? I have an hour and a half car ride home every day from work. You know what? Let's talk when I'm in the car, which sounds crazy, but it can be a very good time um, to do it. So you, you got to know who you're talking to and you got to know when you're pitching and what time of day and location and all this. This It matters. It absolutely matters for it. Um, yeah. There was another hand up. Go ahead. Is that is is that person a decision maker? Yeah. Are they the only decision maker? No. Okay. Well, then I'd work around them then. I would work with all the other people that are the decision makers. I, again, my goal with people that either don't care or working against me is to neutralize them. I may never be able to get them over to be 100% behind what I'm doing, but I also don't want them to blow up my meeting. So some people, my only goal is neutralize. Others, I want to bring them on as an ally and have, have them help me sell this product, this idea, this change for it. So in that case, I would look to the other people, the other decision makers and say, what's my relationship like with them? How invested are they in the project? How much are they willing to go to bat for me? Nothing is more influencer than someone else doing it for you, whether that's a customer or a coworker or an endorsement from another area within the company. So use the other people and leverage them as much as possible for it. Because you're going to, you're going to face people in life that aren't going to be enthusiastic about what you do. They're not going to be a hundred percent behind it. That's okay. But I just don't want you to take my product or take my meeting. So I need to figure out a way to sort of neutralize as opposed to, you know, bring you on board as a cheerleader and helping me sell this idea. Does that make sense? Would that work in the situation that you're talking about? <laughs> um you know what people are it's it's human nature and i want to know where they stand and so i don't give up very easily on things to me it's always about finding the right way to do it um and looking at it through the person's eyes, not how I think is the best way, what's the best way to them and trying to make it work. If I'm not getting anything from them, I'm going to work around them. But I would never start by doing that. I would start by doing my best effort to work with people and bring them into the fold and get them to buy into it um, and deal with people that are on board sort of one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I know, I think, are we over for time? Are we going over? Okay. Okay. Any more questions for anyone here? Sure, go ahead. Last one. So um, my question is more like the goals pitching and mm -hmm. building their idea. So what I've noticed is, especially in corporate settings, 
but uh, this is my last question. Uh, the idea of debt opening and mm -hmm. then there will be incremental changes. And I work in real estate, so like the project mm -hmm. duration is a lot. And there will be incremental changes to the pro to the project that will be suggested. And then after including all of those, the product would lose its authenticity, right? And mm -hmm. then you'd be told that, oh, it's a great product, it's a good product. So how do we, like, and push back may not always be an option because the, the difference in authorities. Mm -hmm. So yep. like, how do we deal with that? So sometimes it's about anticipating, not the questions we're going to get today, but six months or a year from now. So in those types of challenges, I like to create a place. One, I want to respect them. I want to capture them. And I want everyone to know that I've captured them because sometimes people just want to be heard. And they want to know that you've heard what they were saying. So I keep a running list of things that comments I've been given, things we need to consider for the future. Maybe I'm not going to act on them today. Maybe every piece of feedback I'm getting is not useful to me. It probably isn't. There's never a point I've ever had where all the questions and all the feedback were, were good and useful. But you want to make that person feel like they're acknowledged and that you've heard them. So a way to do that is included in there somehow without actually making a change to the product. We heard you, we're taking this into consideration for now, here we are for it. Um, it's not perfect. They may dig their heels in and say, you know, no, we have to make this change. Then it's a group decision. I, I will very quickly take it out of me versus them and make it, here's the question, here's the pros, here's the cons, and let the group decide what they want to do with it. Um, the worst position you're ever going to be in is me versus you for everybody, because we all get defensive and rightfully so tone can set us off. Things can do that. The more you can keep the topic on the product or the innovation, the better off you are. And if, if it's a struggle, literally put a slide up, Hey, let's capture all these pros and cons, even if we're not making a decision today so that we can continue to think about it and do it that way for it. Um, but capturing them, making feel like they're heard and then deciding collectively, is this worth it? Um, on the meeting. But if they see it in writing, it helps. It helps that they, they know you heard them. And then the, the collectively, the group can decide based on the pros and cons, which is the right way to go. Because at some point, it's not really up to you. It's up to that larger group. So pro con the best you can, and that'll do it. I have time after this, so I'm happy to answer any other questions for anybody. Um, but I respect the fact that we had a time set for this. So uh, we, we can wrap this up. But I'll be around for questions if anyone wants to talk some more about it or specific circumstances. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate it.